Okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Amanda Radovic. I'm with the Cluster Initiative, the UAS Cluster Initiative of Oklahoma and Kansas, and welcoming you all today to our webinar series. Today's topic is the evaluation process, determining your company or technology's worth. So we have several special guests, and for this webinar, we have a special guest moderator, Michael Tharp. So thank you, Michael, for being our moderator today. So without further ado, Mike, I'd like to introduce you, our guest moderator today. So we thank you and welcome you. Um, Mike Tharp is the co-founder and managing director of Cimarron Capital Partners. They've been investing in private equity and venture capital funds on behalf of institutional clients since 1993. Mike specializes in creating and managing diversified fund-to-fund -fund management programs that meet both financial and strategic objectives of investors. So Mike, you and our panelists today have a lot of experience in valuations. We're really excited to have you. So I will turn it over to you and tell us more about yourself and what we can expect to hear today. Okay, thank you, Amanda. We uh, enjoy being here and helping with a cluster uh, initiative. We will have uh, just a little bit more about Cimarron Capital. We've been in business since um, the early 90s. We did our first deal in 93, as Amanda mentioned, and uh, we primarily build fund of funds on a diversified basis for uh, institutional clients, and those are typically states. We will have uh, two panelists uh, with us today. One you can see on the screen, the other one you can't, but we have with us Mike Krauss, and I'm gonna ask him to introduce himself. He's going to be covering three of the six topics that we've got for uh, this one hour session. And then we have Emmanuel Martinez, and after Mike introduces himself, I'll ask Emmanuel to introduce himself, and he will be covering the other three topics, and we'll rotate back and forth. Uh, with that, Mike Kraus, if you'd introduce yourself, please. Hey, thanks, Mike. I'm pleased to um, be on the panels today. Pleased to be off and off the UAS so cluster in the ship. Uh, by way of background, I've spent almost 30 years in corporate development and strategy development. I Currently employed with uh, IP Capital Group, which is a pure play management firm uh, based out of Burlington, Vermont. We typically uh, work with small and mid-sized firms uh, on their intellectual property strategy planning, and/or occasionally we also get involved with investment theses, where somebody's looking to put a bunch of money into a company and want to understand what the value of underlying enterprise is. Uh, so we use a variety of different techniques. Uh, we service a variety of uh, customers across all sorts of vertical markets, uh, and we've been doing it for almost 20 years now. And we have about 800 or 850 uh, engagements under our pants. So that's about it. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, thank you. Emmanuel, if, uh, even though we can't see you, and uh, if you'd introduce yourself, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Amanda, thank you for sponsoring uh, UAS and uh, Michael, thank you very much for being the moderator. I'm Emmanuel Martinez. I'm the General Managing Director for Green Hills Capital Partners, Green Hills Ventures. We're a private investment holding company. So we established ourselves in here in New York, and we have an office in Luxembourg where uh, we established ourselves in uh, 2001. So it's going to be 17, almost 18 years now. Um, next year, and we invest out of two primary primary investment arms, uh, GH Fund 2, 1 to 5 million uh, in medical device companies, uh, healthcare, mobility, wireless, cloud, and now cybersecurity, as well as blockchain. And the second investment arm, which is typically designed for follow-on investment, um, invests 5 to 25 million. So, uh, we have some institutional investors, UBS, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, uh, that allocate uh, capital to us to deploy as GP, and we um, we make investments in this fashion using what we call milestone investing approach. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, in terms of valuation and creating value, I think we do pretty much uh, the lower end of the investment spectrum, 
to be able to drive valuations in a quantified manner. That's our philosophy, our investment thesis, and uh, I love the opportunity to share you know, some of our investments uh, in this space. So thank you. Great. With that, uh, we'll uh, start with the first topic. Uh, Emmanuel will uh, start us off with why, value, why valuations matter in startups. Emmanuel? Well, thank you again, uh, Mike. Uh, so this is a white paper that we co-authored um, along with uh, Costello. And one of the things that we talk about is valuations, particularly because we're not a venture fund and uh, not a big one, at least, that you would see in Silicon Valley. But we do make investments. And so we, we happen to focus our efforts in the A round investment, which is somewhat the lower end of that spectrum. And so valuations to us uh, matter in two cents. One is if we're investing in, you know, startup companies, knowing that there's going to be follow on investment then the driver for us is how to quantify and increase the enterprise value of the company, not because we've uh, poured money into it, but because of the fact that the companies have been able to meet uh, certain uh, milestones. So the definition of milestones is obviously being able to achieve a particular event or um, in the business, you know, in the business world, being able to execute what you say you're going to be able to do. So um, we we have a couple of examples here that talk about the difference between deploying capital in the A round or seed stage into a startup and how we put some discipline into it, into those companies so that, you know, the more traditional venture capital firm and I believe there's one graph here that you'll see that talks about, you know, kind of the death valley. And you know, we, we look at that space and say, well, how do we, you know, e effectively increase the returns on a lower exit versus deploying so much capital so that we have to look for the $500 uh, million dollar investments, which essentially is, is very far in, in between. Um, so that's uh, essentially what we talk about in general terms here. Um, there's a lot of specificity and examples that we could go through, but in, in general, that's kind of the, the space that we tend to excel in. Okay. That's the value of death that uh, Emmanuel was talking about. Mike, Mike if I may, uh, I'm sorry. I, I just want to be able to commend you know, Mr. Krauss for this graph, yeah, because it is a depiction of what a lot of startup companies fall into this, this whole valley of death. And, and I think it's a great graph. What it seems to indicate is while the company is not cash flow positive, you know, it falls under this development stage where there's a lot of uh, potential for failure. So you'll see a lot of losses. And once it hits that inflection point, you know, two things happen. One is the increase in value because they've been able to demonstrate going from cash flow negative to cash flow positive, but also scale, replicate what they've been able to do and uh, be able to attract much more smart capital for greater valuation. So that's that's what I just wanted to add to this to this graph. I think it's a great graph. Mike, any comments on this uh, section? Other than it's a great graph? <laughs> no, I mean, Emmanuel paints out a pretty important, uh, you know, set of issues. Why would an investor put cash in? Uh, they certainly aren't doing it from a charity perspective. They're looking at it for returns. And despite the merits of the business, it's all about uh, peaking the return back to the investor, the ROI. Uh, Manuel is 100% on target with that. We've gone through a lot of uh, smaller firms where we've done valuations facing the same thing. And occasionally we do provide them a recommendation to use it early versus paying on to the end dollar. Okay. Thanks. And Mike, we'll uh, turn it over to you now for valuation methodologies, uh, including discounted cash flow and market comps. Okay. Well, thanks uh, very much, Mike. 
Yeah, thanks, perfect. So uh, none of this is particularly rocket science. Um, typically when you go to a business school, they will explain there's three primary ways to conduct an evaluation on a business. You can either do the income approach or a market approach or a cost approach. I'm gonna talk about each one just a little bit. Uh, typically we get called by companies uh, who are e either looking to collateralize their business or you know, use the bank loan to provide debt financing or they're looking at an acquisition. I, I had an example uh, not long ago, about 12 months, it was a very small company, basically three guys that started up a business in financial technology. Uh, and they had come up with a pretty cool solution and they wanted to understand that they had just received an, uh, an offer to be acquired in totality for about 18 million. And they came to us and they said, well, we don't know if that's the right number. <clears throat> so our job, was to work with them to kind of figure out what a fair and reasonable market-based price would be. And so to that extent, uh, we did two different models. We did an income approach and we did a market approach. Let me talk about the income approach uh, at first. So this basically says you're going to simulate what that business looks like going forward. Uh, Emmanuel pointed out the other curve which shows the valley of death. Obviously, to get your business up and running, there's going to be what we call an investment period where you're making you know, you're not making any money, your revenue is uh, negative. And so you will end up taking your theoretical business case, you can do it on Excel, and you will extend it out a period of time, five, 10, maybe 15 years. But hopefully it, it, a period of time that sounds reasonable to the investment community. You'll bake into that the expenses, and, and you saw on the other chart, uh, the value of death, you've got some R&D, you're going to have development, and then there's a huge amount of cash required to commercialize, which is, you know, getting inventory, building product, getting through distribution. And then at some point, uh, your uh, revenues, hopefully if the product is successful, will exceed your cost, and you'll be on the positive side of that curve. And so what the income model requires you to do is to estimate all those various costs and revenues through some finite period of time. And then once you've got that cost figured out, you then kind of get into uh, what you believe some of the assumptions were. And uh, three of the key ones that we look at here are TAN, SAM, and SOM, which you'll get out of business school. Total available market, which says how big is the pot. Served available market, which will be a subset, right, which says, yeah, I might be looking at the total global opportunity for certain services, but realistically, I can only operate out of the U.S. And then the third, which is another subset from SAM, now talks about the true market you can uh, obtain, or that's what the O stands for in SAM. And so you begin to segment the markets. You begin to look at truly what your revenue opportunities will be. And then you begin to, what I call, rate them with competitive or substitute products. You have a look at how efficient your distribution channel will be, how long it's going to take you to get to market, and then we apply a discount rate or a risk factor. So getting back to the example I, I had started with, the financial tech piece, this was a small firm, three guys, had some pretty cool technology. They were playing in the credit card space, and specific, specifically, they had a technology that would disintermediate the banks. And so rather than the banks being the clearinghouse, they had a way to do it peer-to-peer -peer through cell phones and encryption, that kind of stuff. So when we were looking at their business case, they had a huge market. Uh, you know, their market was, I can't recall exactly how many transactions, but you're talking trillions of dollars every year of flow. And if they could acquire one, two, or three percent of it, that would have yielded millions and millions of dollars of potential revenue. And so we went through that model a couple of times. We had a look at what the, you know, the products looked like uh, along with distribution channels. So let me just draw that story through a quick close. The distribution channel is key because the offer they had reached for 18 million was from an equally small firm, well, probably more than three guys, they had about 30 people. Uh, but they didn't have a lot of brand equity, they weren't well known. And so, you know, their ability uh, to move this company's product through their channels was limited. And so when we got back to them, it took us about four to six weeks to figure out what the value was on the income approach. We gave them good news, and, and part of the good news was, well, you know that 18 million dollars is about right for the person who offered it to you. But we said, we think you're missing a bigger pot here, which is about 105 million. And the primary reason is, is you would be more attractive to somebody else who had a larger distribution channel 
and a bigger name. And as a result, you get about a 5X premium versus what this guy offered you at 18 million. So, uh, you know, one of the key things when you're talking about these income approaches is making sure you've got a clear line of sight as to what your revenue opportunities are and what the risk factors are. Uh, the second approach we go through, and we actually did this for the small financial technology uh, company, is a market comparables, which basically says, okay, for a company who is similarly situated in a similar market with similar products, what would they get? And so the trick here is trying to find enough comparisons out there. Certainly for smaller companies, it's it's tougher than the bigger companies where you know the well-known factors and there's a lot of press around it. But the key thing here is to recognize that when doing the comps, no two companies are ever going to be alike. So you're never going to go find a company you can say, I look like one of those. Invariably, what ends up happening is you will look like a company, three, four, maybe five different companies, all of who have bits and pieces of what you look like. And then the finesse here is to try to come up with a way to synthesize the comparable based on these other comps that are out there. And the key thing is, is trying to understand what the perspective is of the potential buyer. So uh, to talk about that, what that really means is if you've got a buyer who is looking to gain access to the market, who would be looking at acquiring your technology or your business as a synergistic piece for them, they're going to be looking at it quite a bit different in terms of valuation versus if it's a seller, and I hate to say this, but a seller looking to take you out of play. Potentially it's a competitive play. They see you disrupting the technology. We want to make sure that you know they'll acquire you for a different reason. I, I think the transaction we were uh, pursuing, it was in the healthcare market. It had to do with um, embedding sensors under the skin for uh, glucose detection. Uh, mm -hmm. It was an interesting. We had uh, some great technology. A lot of it was patented, and we received an offer for one of the larger firms out there. Uh, and they saw our technology as being very disruptive. And so they made us an offer, which we considered to be substantially undervalued. But our best choice was actually to take this health technology forward, and we would have had to go spend another 30 million on uh, phase three and phase two clearances for the FDA. So what ended up happening was we took that offer, the, the buyer really was only interested to submarine the technology, and unfortunately we didn't get top dollar for that. So, you know, one of the key things is making sure you're being very, being very realistic about these market comps and that you're looking at them from the perspective of how the seller wants to see it, not necessarily as you believe it should be. And then the last approach down here is a cost approach. Not sure if that's necessarily applicable to a lot of you out there. But basically, the cost approach would be what would it cost somebody else to reproduce what I am offering? And so typically, you'd have a look at R&D costs. You go look at investment to get products developed, potential uh, distribution partners. And one of the biggest things that we've found that people tend to uh, ignore is they look at the opportunity cost, which basically says, if somebody else had to develop this, how long would it take and how much of that time would they delay, be delayed from entering the market? So you have to uh, allocate a certain amount of value associated with market access and being timely in terms of getting to the market. So the net answer here on valuation models, not one model is the perfect solution. We will always use two models and try to triangulate on what the right approach is. And then invariably, there's always going to be discussion on assumptions. When we are doing our cash flow analysis and when we uh, begin to do discounting the forward cash flows, a lot of people think about, you know, weighted average cost of capital, which is great, right? Which talks about, you know, I'm going to make an investment in this particular technology or this particular business, how would I compare that investment to another investment I would make? And people always go look at their cost of capital to help them make that, that decision. When we're doing it, uh, we're very much more focused on the technology side. We get the market risks, you know, we get the, uh, the risk associated with poor execution. But the piece we look at is especially relevant for early stage companies, specifically early stage companies we're coming out with a new technology, is what we call this technology risk, which layers on top of your discount rate. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on this. This is kind of well known in the field of uh, uh, valuations that we work in. 
essentially you're going to have your cost of capital, which might be eight, ten, or twelve percent um, based on what where the market is. But on top of that, you have to look at how risky the technology is. And the bottom of this chart kind of gives you some simple language to kind of understand that. So as an as an example, if you're looking at new technology, but it's really well known, everybody's figured it out. It would be a substitute technology for existing markets. Well, that's going to be relatively low risk. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, if you're looking at something that's completely brand new, and you know we're looking right now at a potential firm, they're going to be entering the high density lithium battery uh, technology. So that even though lithium batteries are well known, what they're doing is not. They're doing something totally unique. And as a result, for them, is going to be a new tech, new products unproven high safety concerns and so as a result they'll be on the opposite side of the technology so what you'll have is kind of the cost of capital sitting down there where i kind of show on the lower left will be about the 10 percent 8 10 12 percent but you got to layer on top of that the technology risk which means even though you may think your business is worth 10 15 30 million over the long haul what an investor is going to be looking at is what is the risk of the embedded technology inside your business? And they will obligate you to kind of take a haircut to make sure you're looking at this thing realistically. Either that or that there is a huge return on their risk coming into the business. So when we're doing these evaluations, we're going to be working within the 20 to 60 percent discount range for some of these technology. Once again, depending upon just how raw and how novel they are. Uh, Emmanuel, got anything to add to this section? Um, no, other than the fact that I, I think that it was all on target. Um, and uh, the only thing I, I wanted to add to this is that, you know, um, the way we look at um, making investments in early stage companies is somewhat similar in that we look at a premium risk to capital. So our premium risk of capital is, you know, when we're making an investment in an early stage company where we need to develop um, not only the R and you know the, the the technology, but also do, for instance, sometimes clinical trials where you know it's it's capital intensive. Uh, what we'd like to, what we typically like to do, is um, go to some of our corporate strategic partners, and we have a few that we've sold our companies to uh, early on to see what two things. Number one is um, they always have vast resources to provide. Um, uh, research and development. Uh, number two, they, they also have venture funds of their own. So we've sold companies to uh, Covidian, which is now part of Medtronic. Um, we've licensed our companies, our wound care product to Johnson & Johnson. We sold Medrax to Bristol Squibb. And when we made those investments, we went to our corporate strategic partners, whether we were uh, Microsoft and assuming that they would tell us, look, it's too early stage, but very interesting technology. This is what we like to look at when you get further along. And that gives us some window of what we think the valuations have got to be, what kind of milestones um, we need to put in place for the companies to execute over a period of one year, two years, um, and then go back to you know uh, the Microsofts of the world or the Covidians, which is part of Medtronic, and say, we've achieved X, Y, and Z. It's not what you're looking for, but maybe we can partner. And that usually lends into uh, the discussion about licensing or an outright acquisition uh, if, if they get some critical mass and they get uh, enough of a, you know, data, whether it's clinical trials uh, or customers. You know, we like the recurring revenue customer base. So we try to model um, most of our investments uh, in that um, uh, recurring revenue, if you will. So, so in terms of you know mitigating some of the risk, uh, I think part of our tranche investment approach uh, dovetails, um, uh, you know, a lot about what what we talked about here with regards to managing risk, because you're never going to be able to mitigate risk. There are so many outside forces other than doing the economics and coming up with financial models, because that's all in the future. What we try to do is figure out what the near-term um, you know, premium risk to capital and how do we get the company from burning cash to a cash flow positive or break even where we see valuations exponentially increase. 
And that's typically within, you know, two years, three years, sometimes four. We've got portfolio companies going into the seventh, eighth year. Um, but, um, you, you know, and, and at some point we, we need to either put more capital into the company or get them uh, into one of our strategic partners. So um, I agree. I, I agree with um, a lot about, you know, um, this kind of uh, adjusting, you know, cash flow and discounted cash flow and premium risk to capital in, in early stage companies. Thank you. Um, one of the ways to avoid uh, pinning a particular value on a specifically early stage company is the use of uh, convertible debt. Uh, Emmanuel, would you take us through a discussion of the pros and cons of that? Sure. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of companies coming to us with quite a bit of um, uh, liabilities on the balance sheet. So we, we are very financially centric, uh, focused investors. So we look at the balance sheet, we look at the paid in capital, we look at how much the company has raised. And more importantly, we, we look at uh, intangible, tangible assets. But um, I'd say seven out of 10 companies uh, come to us with some form of debt on the balance sheet. And it could be from founders, capital, um, going into the company as a convertible note. Sometimes it's a combination of a convertible note given certain hurdles that the company, you know, will meet. Uh, for instance, the next round of financing, uh, which is our round, A round, and then it automatically converts with some kind of a discount. Or in many cases, depending on the financial situation of the founders or the investors, um, they want to get paid back. So what we do is uh, whenever we are looking at, um, you know, uh, liabilities on the balance sheet with extraordinary uh, outstanding debt, we, we put in together a sidecar, what we call a sidecar. And the sidecar is essentially designed to eliminate a lot of that convertible debt by either paying it off or giving them a discount to convert uh, into our A round. Um, and we bring in some of our private clients on the wealth management side, mostly family offices like us. And we put the pool together of investors uh, that um, uh, might, you know, essentially address that convertible net um, so that we can convert it or, uh, or pay it off. And so once the balance sheet is clean, then you don't have that premium cost of capital that essentially is, is in the earnings that have to be paid for either accrued interest or deferred interest. Um, and uh, obviously the debt to equity ratio is, is much better and, and uh, the company has less things to think about other than focusing on the business and uh, using our capital to uh, grow and develop their business further along without any over, you know, without any um, uh, issues with regards to liabilities on the balance sheet other than maybe payables. But, but convertible notes are um, a little bit of a tricky situation because they come first in line uh, uh, before the equity. So we have to subordinate to uh, debt holders. Uh, that's just the pecking order that we live in, the, the world we live in. So we, we try to clean it off so that, uh, again, we have a, a much better threshold in terms of not only execution, but also be able to um, increase the value of the company without having so much debt on the balance sheet. Uh, debt also can mean bank debt. So I just want to talk a little bit about the difference between convertible notes or uh, redeemable notes or debt. There, there is a bank debt that some companies go to, and we use that um, as well, uh, not as an investment, but we bring in some of our institutional partners uh, to be able to look at a company and provide some form of credit facility. So let me give you an example, for instance, with Medirax or even with uh, Info Crossing, which we invested in, once they got to the point where uh, they were executing and they were getting purchase orders for a particular project, and the particular project could be um, a 2 million, 3 million, 4 million uh, over a period of one year, um, then we, we look at 
you know, what would that piece of paper in the form of, of a purchase order of a, or, or a letter of intent uh, or licensing mean in terms of going to the bank and getting a credit facility against that? And so we've done that at least four or five times where we bring in one of our corporate strategic partners or one of our institutions that's willing to uh, provide the financing. Uh, we did the same thing with CVS. We did a private label um, service agreement uh, with CVS where they private labeled one of our products, which is a combination of bamboo and sugar cane to make paper. So things like toiletries, um, a paper towel, um, you know, toilet paper, napkins, uh, we, we created them out of bamboo and, and sugar cane as opposed to uh, trees. Uh, so very sustainable, eco-friendly. And uh, we got a purchase order from CVS, which is one of our corporate strategic partners. And instead of, you know, having to put our products on the shelf, uh, they decided to private label it under their own brand. So all we have to do is basically drop ship um, you know, the, the products in three different uh, major locations um, in at CVS, and we got paid on the purchase order. Uh, but that purchase order was more than what we were willing to finance. Uh, it was about $5 million that had to be done, paid um, within a very short period of time, about 45 days. And we went to a bank um, that we have a relationship with, and we got a credit facility for uh, I believe it was eight eight million dollars. So we used it to draw down and pay the manufacturers, so that they could wrap it, uh, put it into containers, and drop ship it with that purchase order. Because CVS is a good a good brand and um, you know good uh, paper uh, in terms of rating and and uh, and risk for the bank. So um, so there are forms of you know, there are forms of liabilities that could help companies. You just have to pick and choose which ones I think suit best, depending on the stage of where you are. If you're getting purchase orders, you know, uh, you have to you have to evaluate whether uh, it's it's worth the equity for the investment, because you know, at that point, um, maybe we do a bigger round but a higher valuation, or we go to bank financing and just pay it off, then recycle that. So we we've been able to grow on those two different trash, those two different trajectories, you know, depending on um, where the company is. Thank you, Mike. Do you have anything to add uh, regarding convertible debt? Well, um, specifically on convertible debt, that's a little bit out of our headlights in terms of what it is that we do. Although having said that, uh, we do partner with a variety of other uh, investment firms who work with the small companies that we bring forth to them who are looking for investment, a variety of mechanisms, the way Emmanuel uh, highlighted, we'll use a variety of mechanisms that best suit the stage of where the company is and what their longer term needs are, whether or not it's debt financing or uh, it's convertible debt or something else. Um, one of the key aspects that I've come to understand, uh, certainly from some of the smaller firms looking for investment, uh, is what does the strategic landscape look like? Or in other words, who would likely be a good investor for me that can bring to the deal more than just money? Could be distribution, could be brand name, it could be potentially technology combinations. A lot of the smaller firms we've been starting to work with are really looking at the strategics providing a lot more than cash because they all recognize how hard it is to go along. They, they're looking for kind of like a shark tank type of a thing. Who's out there that can do more than what um, than just writing a, a check? So we've worked with a number of other firms. Uh, we provide them with our synopsis in terms of what we think the market value is. And then what we'll do is we'll out what some of the intangible value would be from the strategic as well. And that gets baked into it. And then you've kind of got a, a couple of set of different numbers. You've got it with the strategic and without. And it becomes an interesting conversation at the table. They're trying to paper the deal and figure out what goes next. So that's kind of the extent of our financing. Thank you. Uh, in uh, terms of understanding where your uh, 
technology fits in the in the marketplace. Uh, Mike, will you talk a little bit about the uh, intellectual property uh, aspect of uh, valuing a business, please? Certainly, we'll do. So this is a hot topic, certainly in the space that we've been operating now for the last uh, two years. The basic issue is, is when you kind of look at where the U.S. has been over the last half a century, right? After World War II, the U.S. was a powerhouse for manufacturing. And then after that kind of peaked, uh, we became very much more uh, service-oriented. And then we caught wind of the fact that you've got offshore services. And so then we transformed into a technology economy. And I'm happy to say the U.S. continues to clearly dominate the technology. But one of the things that underlies all this technology, it's not the hard assets about what it is you produce that's valuable. It's about the stuff you know. It's not about the hard assets. It's about the knowledge embedded in the company. But lots of examples. So for those of you who are old enough and remember Alan Greenspan, he coined a term back in the late 70s, early 80s, that intangible assets were like 65% of the enterprise value. Uh, in a recent study that was done just a few years ago, that number is no longer 65, it's now 80%. In fact, I tend to think it's higher uh, than that. I think it's closer to 85 or, or 90%. So one of the key things when we're going in on a valuation for a small, a small startup is you, you don't have a lot of assets. You don't have a lot of stuff you know, that I can pick up and carry to the bank as collateral. So we're trying to really assess how much value is apportioned to the knowledge embedded in the company. So what we're looking at when we're going in to do a valuation on a company is, is we're trying to understand how much of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis is valuable or potentially another way to go look at it if your competitor knew what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, what would they consider it in terms of value? And so you've got some examples here on the right-hand side. You could be talking about functional specs for your service or your product offering. You could be talking your roadmaps that are five years out, which are tightly guarded and very, very secretive. You could be talking operational know-how. We were working with a small firm out of Princeton. This was about eight months ago. They had just, just been acquired by a very large semiconductor firm out of Europe. And the semiconductor firm asked us to go in. And they said, we just bought this company. They've got some very interesting technology related to consumer electronics, specifically smartphones. And we want to understand what it is we actually bought. And so they asked us to go in and do an audit on their intangibles. And they didn't have a lot to show. They had some notebooks. They had some spreadsheets, some other stuff. But what we found out was they had a very specific methodology for doping the semiconductor. Not that doping is novel, but the recipe that they were using and how they were achieving the certain yields on that semiconductor were very, very unique and high value. And so uh, what we did is we actually worked with them to help them codify that, um, that information. And we reported back to the semiconductor firm. We said, you know, you've got some good news here. Good news, bad news, we said. <clears throat> the good news is, uh, yeah, they got great stuff, uh, and we think they've got like 30 or 35 different concepts. The bad news is none of it's codified. None of it is reduced to a tangible form in forms of having been written down and registered that you could point a figure at and say, yeah, that's an asset of the company. And so this little startup that had a little bit of homework to do, it had to go back and had to kind of codify everything that it did, because at the end of the day, once they get acquired, you can't buy people, right? What you're buying is knowledge of the firm. And so to the extent you don't have your knowledge and your know-how reduced to something that can be passed off to somebody else, that value is what I call erythral. It's great in concept, but you can't take it to the bank. And so what we like to do with firms, specifically on intangible assets, is we'll go in and help them codify what they know and how they do it. And that becomes something that can be valued fairly easily and presented to a potential investor as having merit. So on this page, you're looking at the general topic of intangibles. You've got the usual thing that everybody thinks about, which is the goodwill and the brand and the trademarks. You've got the hard assets, which are the fixed ones. And we work specifically in the intangible space, which talks all about this know-how, all about the technology, about the stuff you've done. One other uh, area that I, I like to point out, and, and this is an area not a lot of people think about, you know, people always think about, oh, I spent, you know, $2 million on an R&D. Um, and it reduces to a product that you can build and you can produce fairly easily in a factory somewhere. 
But what they fail to understand in terms of the real value is that $2 million of R&D, guess what? That represents $2 million of failure. That represents $2 million of you learning what doesn't work. And the question I always ask, like, like to ask people is, what if one of your competitors found out what didn't work because one of your employees spilled the beans as, oh, you know, we tried that six different ways, and none of it worked. Well, what would happen if your competitor heard about that? Not about the success, but they heard about the failures. Well, guess what? They've now got those six or seven different ways that they now have become aware of that don't work, and they will ignore it to try to fill a competitive product. So one of the things we always work with people when we're talking about R&D efforts is to codify the failures. Codify what the value of that would be to somebody else. And if they didn't know about it, they would have to go spend maybe $3 million because of inflation. Maybe they don't have guys as smart as you. And so as a result, the failures, the fact that you can point your finger at the failures, those have apparent value in terms of getting to market faster than anybody else. And so we'll put a value on that Included as part of the valuation. Um, Harv, if you can go to the next one, I want to just do a bit of a, a small case study on this thing. I won't spend a lot of time. Uh, American Superconductors is a small firm based out of Wisconsin, and this would have been back about eight or nine years ago. Uh, this was when wind power was uh, a big deal, when you know everybody was being renewable and green energy. They had come up with a clever way to uh, connect the turbines generating the power to the grid. And they had a way of managing the horsepower and everything else that went into it, so it was very, very efficient. They uh, were really more of an engineering firm. They, they did the software, but they didn't do the actual hardware design. And what they ended up doing was partnering with a Chinese firm. And that Chinese firm was going to go build the turbines and then sell it into the U.S. market. And then AMSC was kind of going to get a royalty slice out of those proceeds and you know it would be good for both firms. Well, what ended up happening here is that uh, Sinovel, which was the hardware manufacturer, ended up uh, stealing the AMSC software and algorithms for controlling the electric flow back to the power grid. And they produced a knockoff product. If you can go to the next slide, uh, Harv, what ended up happening was once it was discovered by the market, and by the way, AMSC was publicly traded, once the market found out that their secret sauce had been stolen by the Chinese, they lost in a period of a month or two months, $1 billion in market cap. That's a billion dollars of some investor having lost their money. On top of that, they had to lay off 700 people, which was roughly about 50% of their global workforce. Why? Because their secret sauce was now out in the wild. Somebody else could obtain this software, as an example, and build competing products. So what that value was for that trade secret or for that IP, that intangible, was a billion dollars of market cap. That's big money. I have another example. Three guys, another three guys operating in their backyard. They do software engineering for hot rods, so they're kind of out of the local Chicago market. They um, started very small, three guys in the backyard. I think it started on the West Coast, finally migrated to Chicago for some reason. But they called us in and said they had a problem. Their business was doing really well. They were probably doing about $15 million a year in sales. They had about 30 employees. And it was growing as fast as they could imagine. And part of the problem was they could not keep up with the customer demand. And so they hired some software engineers. Well, it turns out that they didn't do the background checks very well because one of the software engineers found a free ticket to the software repository, took a copy, and sold it to one of their competitors. So uh, they had found out about it. Unfortunately, the software was released into the wild, and so it had placed immediately into jeopardy this running business because, once again, the software was in the wild, and they had no way of clawing it back. They asked us to come on in and see if we could do something about it, but the unfortunate part of that point was that the software was out, and the firm had not codified their knowledge in the forms of a reduced it to practice that they could use in court. And so as a result, there was very little that we could do. And so right now they're in a bit of a fire drill trying to figure out what their next steps are. So for that particular firm, they got 30 employees potentially going to be put out of work because their software now is no longer uh, competitively protected. Thanks, Mike. Emmanuel, have you got anything to add to the IP discussion? We're ready to move on to balance sheets. 
with um, uh, intellectual property has always been uh, a challenge for uh, some of our companies, especially in the medical device side of the business. Um, you know, there's a lot of outsourcing that we look at that um, might affect the cost of cost of sales or cost of R and D, and and I think the codification um, explanation and and uh, uh, information is valuable, uh, especially when software is involved. Uh, the only thing I want to add is, based on our experience, uh, what, what we like to do is do it on a two or three phase process where you have um, you, you have the device and the molding done uh, and, and the equipment and um, uh, you have it offshore and then you bring it into the U.S and you, you insert or install the software in the U.S. Uh, to prevent um, pirating uh, and getting knockoffs. So we, we've had uh, some experience with that. So Mike, uh, thank you very much for that. The uh, next topic, importance of a clean balance sheet and what types of problems can be avoided? Sure, well, uh, balance sheets always very important. Uh, everybody knows that. Uh, I think the debt to equity, some formulas that um, we are uh, familiar with, the debt to equity. So we try to put in more of the equity side into a company to um, uh, to increase the, the equity as opposed to the um, total liabilities that are on the balance sheet. And as I said before, the most favorable um, enterprise value companies that we've invested in have had um, a good debt to equity ratio with very little uh, liabilities, more short, you know, mostly payables, which are normal uh, business operating liabilities, but certainly things like deferred salaries, convertible notes, redeemable notes, bank loans, that aren't paid on time, that become outstanding, uh, can create a lot of problems in terms of valuation. So anybody coming in, uh, whether it's our B round, C round on the wealth management side, putting in five to 20, look at that and saying, okay, how much of my first investment tranche has to go out to paying all those liabilities? So we call that paying for past sins. And there's always a premium cost of capital for that. Uh, we're coming in to uh, stabilize the company, stabilize the balance sheet and paying for, you know, things that, um, you know, just uh, happened. And um, uh, we, we, we happen to put um, our investment capital towards paying some of those liabilities, which are immediate. It just goes out the door versus being invested into the company for R&D for sales and marketing for GNA for salaries. So we, we believe that um, having a, obviously an ideal clean balance sheet is uh, the best scenario for increased valuations or enterprise valuations. Thank you. We've got a question that came in. What is the preferred corporate structure for taking on private capital partners? an LLC, a C-Corp, or an S-Corp? And I'm going to toss this one to Emmanuel. Sure. Um, the, the preferred um, is a C-Corp, right? Um, and it all depends on uh, what stage the company is in and um, understanding who your investors are. If it's, a, um, if it's a later stage type of fund, understanding how, ma how many portfolio companies they have and uh, figuring out whether you know there's a liquidity event um, is is obviously very important because sometimes we've invested in LLCs to get the NOL, meaning uh, the carried cost of uh, losses, to offset some of our capital gains. But that doesn't happen very often. So the best uh, structure is really a C corp. Um, the most favorable is obviously Delaware. We've seen. Uh, places like Texas becoming, you know, very tax efficient. Florida is another tax efficient state uh, where you can have a C corp. But the most favorable is Delaware, uh, primarily because of jurisdiction and uh, and 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 universal law. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Mike, let's uh, toss it back to you for sources of data for evaluation. So uh, there's no particular set number of sources that we go to. When we're looking at a particular business valuation, it really depends upon what they're in. You know, Emmanuel's talked about healthcare or, or Medicare. There's a variety of reports available for there. Um, I've got a couple here listed on the page. Though. I always like best the ones that are free. <laughs> Hopefully we sometimes get the client to provide it because they're closest to it. Of course, the, the complications when your client provides it, they tend to only give you the reports that are golden and in the sun. They never give you the reports that uh, you know show a market that's got troubles. Uh, but we'll generally use multiple sources. There was a valuation we just completed uh, recently on stem cells. We used about 17 different reports to triangulate. The reason being was their application of stem cell therapy was very unique. No market currently existed for it. They were going to make it. And so we kind of had, as I said up early, we kind of had to synthesize what that looked like. And so we took data points from a variety of different sources. Uh, you can buy market research reports. They're not cheap. Uh, they're high quality, but they're not cheap. I would tend to think for a startup organization, they'd be pretty tough to justify in buying. Uh, perhaps you can get a little bit of relief from the investment bank that might insist on you know, providing it or, or acquiring it. Obviously, the other stuff that's free is the internet, but with the internet, as we've heard, you've got to be very discerning in terms of where you get the information from. Uh, other places that I've gone to is uh, U.S. Census Bureau tends to provide really good detail on population growth rates. They don't necessarily provide a lot of stuff on the specific markets, but you can obtain that through SIC codes, standard industry codes, or NAIC codes that can help you drill in into some of the specific market segments you're interested in in terms of potential growth, number of companies in play, uh, you know, what are the typical um, take rates for various products. And I just put down for, for grins here, there is one site that I've used multiple times. Uh, it, I don't, you can't say it because it's much of abbreviation, DQI, Y, DJ, uh, where they provide a library of calculators that helps you calculate a variety of in economic indicators, which I've used before to build market representations. For whatever reasons, they offer it for free. It's very, very specific. Unfortunately, the, the content's kind of narrow, but for the purposes that we've been using them for, they're more than adequate. I think the key thing, Mike, you want to understand here is when you're using these sources, you cannot rely on one source. In fact, as I said, one study we did was about 17 different sources. Fortunately, each one of them pointed to a different direction. So the part with that particular deal was trying to get them to link together, that it would make sense. And you know, it's got to pass the common sense test in terms of the numbers you, you add up to. Um, lots of sources out there, really only limited by your creativity and ability to go find them. Thank you, Mike. I would like to personally thank Mike Krause and Emmanuel Martinez for uh, volunteering their time and, uh, and uh, sharing their expertise with us. Okay, folks, again, Mike, Emmanuel, thank you very much. And uh, feel free to download the information here on the website.